if you're just joining us. Again, we're with Bev Kobliner here to talk about So to Speak. I'm so excited to hear and see more about this book. I'm glad that we have a PowerPoint. This is going to be so fun. Okay, so as we talked about in the beginning, this is really the work of your parents. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about this labor of love and getting this book together, what it entailed, how long it took, etc.? Sure. Well, like you said, the book was written by my parents. All the expressions were collected by my parents. Um, and it just came out uh, from Simon and Schuster. But my parents uh, were a couple who were happily married for 65 years. And like you said, my father had a PhD in education and he really focused on underserved populations. So when he was in the army, for example, in the 1950s, he created a program to help soldiers get their diplomas um, because it suddenly became a requirement that in order to stay in the army, they had to have a diploma. So he came up with a, a program to do that um, and was chosen soldier of the month and he had a parade for him <laughs> a long time ago. Um, I guess I was back in the day when they gave parades to people. Um, and my, my mom was a chemistry major, like you said, a science scientist and a teacher. Um, and she was also an excellent writer and a very joyful person who loved language and loved teaching and thought teaching should be fun. Um, and the book um, really stemmed from their love of language, but love of each other as well. Um, and they love the idea that we all have expressions that we grew up with, we heard, whether it reflects the, the time we're from, the place we're from, um, you know, who we grew up with, when we grew up. Um, and so uh, they were both born in 1929. So they were both born right at the beginning of the depression. Um, and my father was really, really, his family was extremely poor. And he, when he was starting to think about becoming a teacher, he actually read the entire dictionary, the abridged dictionary, but he read the whole dictionary. Um, and he said he, he had this amazing vocabulary and he did it, he said, because he wanted to sort of elevate himself. He felt like he was kind of behind the curve and he wanted to learn as many words as he could. Um, so that is to me a real inspiration. He also taught the SATs in our basement. So he taught the English portion to make extra money as a principal. He didn't earn all that much with three kids. So he needed to do that. So this idea of writing the book was, um, it came from a trip that my parents made to my son's kindergarten class years ago. Um, and they were asked to read a book. So they brought a book to read to the children and the kids started getting all squirmy. And my mom, as a teacher, she put down the book and said, hey, you guys, you all have ants in your pants. And the kids are like, ants in your pants, ha! Ah. You know, they didn't, they never heard of that expression before. And my mom explained, oh, it's an expression. It means that you're all jumping like you have ants in your pants. And then my dad said, you know, what's another expression that has to do with insects? And so somebody said, busy as a bee, or uh, my son said, snug as a bug in a rug, or social butterfly. Um, and so from that moment on, my parents, you know, left. They had such a fun time. And they said, we should write a book about this. And they both were of the same mind. And really from the, that day forward, they started jotting down expressions every time they heard them um, leading to this book. Um, they did it for 13 years. And uh, this book is the, the largest expression book of its kind in the world, which is pretty astounding. And they just did it through love of language and having fun. What was it like growing up um, in your household with your parents? What kind of, do you remember any specific word games or things that they would like to do, say around the dinner table or on long trips? Usually in the car, you know, on long trips, or if we were late waiting in line for something at the movies or something you'd have to line up for, um, we would play ghost a lot. And we'd play sort of a name that tune kind of game only with words or songs. Um, we do all kinds of games and it's fun because we did, we did variations of all those, of course, Scrabble was a big one that you can't play in a line, but um, they also did actually a lot of numbers games. My father would say, you know, think of a number between one and a hundred, and then you'd sort of have to see how quickly you can get it um, and teach us tricks about how to, you know, figure out if it's higher or lower, then do you, you get the average, you know, all those kind of things. They were... They, they just did that all the time. Um, 
But uh, in the book, uh, they have um, all kinds of games that are, many of them, it makes me laugh because they're modeled after the games we played um, when I was a kid. Um, but what was interesting, I think, about the way they put this all together was, first of all, they started in their mid 70s. I think in this picture, they're in their late 70s, early 80s. So they looked pretty good for their age too. Um, they were very active. Um, and they said that by putting this book together, they, were, they wanted to practice what they called the art of listening. Um, they would write down expressions they came across in everyday life, whether it was on TV or on radio, often in the newspaper or other books they were reading, even when they went to the grocery store and chatted up the grocer, whoever they were talking to, they would come away with an expression. Um, and like I said, I did, they did this for 13 years. Um, and from the beginning, they vowed not to use Google. So they never used Google for finding new expressions. Um, and they didn't look at expression books or existing collections of expressions. They were very serious about it, you know, on the straight and narrow of expression. And we're gonna do this by talking to people and coming across them in daily life. Um, and then once they had about a hundred or so expressions, you know, usually once a week they would sit down and together categorize them. You know, so if there was fast as a rabbit, hungry as a lion, then that would go in animals or busy as a bee. They first put that in animals and they said, no, you know, animals is getting too big. Let's put that in birds, bats, and insects, things with wings. Um, and my, one of my favorite parts of the book and people comment about this, and I wish you had a copy, Amanda, because well, I'm gonna, when I send you one, but if you see that, the inside cover is, um, oh, oh, there's some, great, is there um, my dad's writing. So when you bring a shirt to the dry cleaner and you need it folded, they send it back and there's usually a hard piece of cardboard in it uh, from the folded shirt so it doesn't crease. Um, and my mom, being from the depression generation, would save those all the time because who wants to throw away good scrap paper? So my dad, when they started collecting expressions, he would use that those note cards uh, to write down expressions. You can see there they have, you know, medical and anatomy and clothing and um, advice. And it was, it's amazing now because I have about a hundred of those note cards where he crossed it out and circled things in red. Um, and uh, once they, you know, ran out of scrap paper, the, this note cards, then they started using legal pads and eventually um, they started, you know, we set up a computer spreadsheet for them so they could type it in. Um, but it, it was sort of such dedication that they, here they are, you know, spending time talking about expressions. Um, and they continued this process for a decade. And even when they got older, my mom, sadly, a few years ago got Parkinson's um, and they had some people helping them out and nurses and but they would always hold court. And whenever they would go through the expressions, my mom was really uh, very uh, mentally fantastic to the end. And uh, they would talk about expressions. They'd set up a little committee with the nurse, my dad, my mom, and one of their kids or one of their grandkids. You know, everybody participated in the process um, to decide, is this an expression? And there would be discussion and debate. You know, my mother would say, Harold, I don't think that really should be an expression or we should put it in the past tense or the present tense. And once they hit 8,000 expressions, my dad started, started offering his grandkids a dollar for each expression, new expression, because they were worried, are they gonna get to 10,000? Um, and then after a few weeks, he's like, this is getting way too expensive. I'm broke, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> and so, um, but that lasted for a little while. Um, and, you know, so I thought, Amanda, if you're willing, and we can do it with everybody if they want to chime in, but um, that we can do a little game, one of the games that was in the book, if you're, if you're game for it. Um, and this I book is it. good. This book is called Origin Story. So I'm going to give you two versions. Uh, one is real and one is not real of where, of where an expression came from. For example, the expression to get cold feet do you think it, it originated one in 19th century England where mothers would warn against their children getting cold feet when they left for school since frostbite was very common or two, 
Is it a military term that referred to warriors with cold feet not being able to rush into battle? I think number two. You are right. Yay! How'd you know that? Um, I don't know. I think maybe the time period might have mm. been a little bit more of a clue. Mm. Yeah. And what to get cold feet means is like you, you're scared to go do something. So it prevents you from doing something. So it seemed yeah. to make more sense with the military. Yeah, that's very good. Very good. Um, Plus I only had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> that is true too. Uh, the next one is crocodile tears. Ooh. So does it come from the fact that when crocodiles weep, they actually do that when they're devouring their prey? And <laughs> scientists have proven that. Or is it too similar to snake oil in the olden days? Um, people would peddle crocodile tears as a health tonic. I think two. Aha, it's one. <laughs> oh. Apparently, oh. when crocodiles eat their prey, they, tears come out of their eyes. So, and the idea of crocodile tears, I remember in third grade, there was a mean teacher who used to yell and say to kids, you have, when they were crying, she would say it's crocodile tears. I have a terrible yeah. memory of that. Fake tears, they Fake happen tears. Kids frequently. You don't really mean it, yeah. Okay, and the last one, honeymoon period. Is it one, in the fifth century, newlyweds drank a spirit made from honey during the first month of marriage, one moon cycle to grant them fertility and good luck? Or is it two, uh, honeymoon was originated by Shakespeare in the comedy, Much Ado About Nothing, referring to the good omen of a full moon on the night of a wedding? <sighs> That's tough because I know Shakespeare was in charge of inventing so many words and expressions. It's a tricky one. I'm gonna say the first though. You're right, you got it. Hey. Uh, newlyweds drinking and the first month of marriage with the moon cycle um, to grant them good fertility. So honeymoon period, it's just fun. So I have all kinds of games like that on our website, uh, which is so to speak book.com. So people go and play these games. Um, and of course in the book, there are dozens of different games um, that you can play. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of a little sampling and it's fun, you know, it's a fun way to engage with family members and it's sort of a non-controversial topic to talk about. Absolutely. And I love it as a way to maybe kind of pull your kids off the screen since so many kids are virtual schooling and just on the computer so much. Right. It's nice to just kind of re-engage with something conversational and a tangible book, something that takes them away from the computer. Right. right. So we did some origin stories there. I know the book has tons of categories. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what some of the other categories um, people might find? Sure. Um, and you're exactly right. My dad used to say that all the time. He's like, oh, when I see your kids, they're always looking at their phones or you know, he said, I could even tell they're looking under the table at their phone. And, uh, and, and it really is something that uh, has changed conversation and even eye contact. So putting it away and the book feels so nice. It's like they used really nice, it's um, a flexi bound cover. <laughs> you know, they did a great job, which, which does make it really fun, I think. Um, but there's 67 categories in the book. And again, me, this meant that for each of the 11,000 expressions, my parents would sit down with that expression and figure out where, what category they think they should, it should go in. And they ended up with 67 of them. My mother always said that was the most fun part, the discuss, discussing and the debating. Um, and it also kind of gives a little glimpse into who they were um, because uh, for example, there's the travel and transportation chapter. So there are obvious expressions in there like frequent flyer or vacation mode or maiden voyage. Um, but you also see the depth of my mother's amazing packing ability. Before she went on the trip, weeks before, she would like line everything up and pack it in such an organized way. And she would pack for my father. And um, so in the travel and uh, transportation chapter, you have all kinds of expressions about packing. 
to send them packing, time to pack it in, to pack light, to carry excess baggage, et cetera. So that always makes me laugh. And I think that's kind of one of the fun quirks of the book. Or uh, in the body chapter, that's the largest chapter and it has over a thousand expressions. So there's brain teaser, brain trust, something on the brain, pick someone's brain, left brain, right brain, no brainer, the brains of the operation. Um, and that's one of my favorite uh, illustrations. Uh, there are hundreds of illustrations like that. Um, but uh, there's also, you know, and other body parts to tickle your throat, an eye for an eye, uh, put your foot in your mouth, to pull someone's leg, a gut reaction, you know, all the expressions you could think of in body. And the smallest category was postal. And you think, why would somebody have a category called postal? And that's because my parents were born in 1929 and they spent a lot of time mailing letters, writing snail mail, another expression, mailing letters. Um, that was a big thing for them. Um, so there are only 25 expressions, but there's some good ones in that chapter, like seal the deal, to go postal, to push the envelope, to mail it in, um, part and parcel. So uh, it was, it's fun for me. And I think when people look through it, you kind of get a kick out of which ones are placed where. Um, and, you know, one of the fav my favorite things about the book is that my parents often categorized expressions based on a key word rather than the literal meaning. So um, it led to kind of some funny results. Like, for example, uh, there's a chapter called The Law. And uh, in The Law, uh, you find terms like to rush to judgment or thick as thieves or good cop, bad cop, all these law related expressions. But if you think about the expression to conduct a sting operation, you think of you know FBI agents undercover. Um, but instead of putting sting operation in the law, they put it in birds, bats, and insects because uh, sting is the predominant word in sting operation. Um, and when then when you pair it with this illustration that we found, uh, it makes clear that with a beehive and lots of buzzing around why sting operation belongs in birds, bats, and insects. So the basic point is, you know, there are 11,000 of these expressions and they analyzed each one. Um, and what was really uh, gratifying, and I wish they knew, but maybe they are together and do know, uh, that um, lexicographers, people who write dictionaries, um, uh, I sent the book to them and other language experts, and I got back all these letters like, yes, this is good for lay people, but it's fantastic. It's a fantastic development in computational linguistics um, because they said that, you know, it's a great resource for natural language processing um, because the book has such a large inventory of multi-word -expre multi expressions. And apparently that's difficult to compile when you're doing it on a computer, whereas so they, you know, sat and did it by hand, and therefore they were able to capture all these multi-word expressions that are much harder to capture if you just try to run a computer program. So I think on many different levels, the book really speaks to people. And what about non-native speakers of English? Have you talked to anyone who might be an English language learner? I know when people try to learn English, the idioms and slang words are always so difficult. Is a exactly. book like this be helpful, do you think, to someone who's trying to learn those kind of idiomatic things about English that are so weird? Yes, and I've talked to a bunch of teachers, ESL, English, uh, English as a second language teachers. And it, it's been really gratifying that they're interested in it. Um, and it makes total sense. Like, you know, any expression you could think of, you know, the bees knees, thinking of bees, you know, what does that mean? Like they're bees and their knees, but why would the bees knees mean something's great? Um, or any anything like we were talking about earlier today, somebody was saying junk mail. If you heard the term junk mail, we all know what junk mail is, but thinking of what junk is and thinking of mail, it's hard to reconcile. So for, for um, English as a second language um, teachers and people learning English, they've told me 
several people have said, I really like this because it's a way for me to learn the idioms. And I could, you know, you know, cross-reference them and finally understand what people are saying. People who have lived here for so long, because, you know, if they, my parents captured 11,000, they haven't gotten all of them in the, in the English language by a long shot. So it must be, uh, it's very difficult to, to uh, learn all these idioms. So I, uh, that, that was another reason my parents felt that it would be useful for people to learn um, English expressions. For sure. One of our attendees wants to know about um, the age level and the reading level. Do you have a sense of what would be most appropriate? It seems like kind of an all ages book, but what are you, what is your take on that? You know, I have to say I've written books for uh, people in their 20s and 30s, and I wrote books for parents. And this one, I feel like is really for all ages. Probably the reading level, it's quite simple. It's just, you know, the categories and then pictures, which is fun for all ages. Um, and also, so I would say maybe a fifth grade reading level kind of thing, but younger kids can pick out a bunch of terms um, mm -hmm. and look at the pictures. It's like a picture book in some ways, but then I've, I've seen such delight on people from people in their fifties and sixties who say, oh, I was going down memory lane and I remembered my mother said this and, you know, some guy said to me, yeah, my father used to always call me dumb as an ox. And that's an expression in the book. You know, it brings back good memories, maybe not so good <laughs> memories, um, but it's it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting like that. And I do think, and also, you know, young people, millennials like you, Amanda, uh, I feel like that there's a real resurgence in game nights. And I know my daughter who's 25 plays, you know, does, goes, does a game night every week. So they're starting to play with the book um, and use some of the different games. Um, so I do think, you know, I think it's a wonderful thing to sit with a child and go through it because it's endless, endless conversations. Um, and, you know, if you don't know what an expression means, you could always Google it, you know, if you need to, but a lot of them, they can guess and discuss where they come from and why. Um, so, and, and I think the illustrations um, to sort of further on that point, um, I would say, you know, there, some of them are so beautiful. Um, and uh, the publisher, Simon & Schuster, they sent the book with a cover and um, it was this cover. This is sort of a fun story that this was the original cover. Um, and my dad, who was 90 years old, looked at it and said, mm -mm. he's like, there's an elephant, but the expression is elephant in the room. So just to have an elephant isn't enough. You need an elephant in a room. Or he didn't like the knock your socks off because it wasn't quite socks being knocked off. Uh, he wanted it to be literal, to really hammer home the point that these are you know, illustrations that tie to expressions. So in the end, I mean, I, I promised him I would do it. And we found illustrations from this amazing archive in the British Public Library and it's online and it's free and you can get all of these illustrations. And we got the elephant in the room and the, the racket for, you know, for something, it's a racket or get a piece of a pie or eye for an eye um, or feather in his cap. You know, I promised him and we, I feel good that we were able to, to accomplish that. Um, and you know, in the process of finding the cover, we came across hundreds of expressions and there are over 350 illustrations in the book. Um, and I thought if people would like, I could just quickly go through a handful of them to see what it looks like. Um, so in the education chapter, in honor of my parents, we have to do the math, uh, no, no easy answers. Uh, too cool for school. This one is one of my favorites because it's from the 1890s. And it looks like such a modern picture to like me. David Bowie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I thought this is just wacky. 1890s. Um, and then, these are so cool. So these are all super vintage, just historic illustrations that you got <laughs> from the British library. Yeah. And, you know, it's good for anyone to know if you ever need a 
cool, interesting illustrations, they're all free. They're in the public domain and they have a beautiful website. And I have to say, I had so much fun looking through all these illustrations and then matching them to expressions. It was, if there was a job to do that, that would be my job. <laughs> but, you know, it really, I think, brought out a lot of the um, fun and the enjoyment. And that's why I think this kind of book is, you know, certain expressions really can hammer home a point to kids, like food and cooking, for example. Um, there are all kinds of fun ones here, like get a piece of pie, or I like the next one, a tough nut to crack, or this one's kind of wild, back in the soup, you know, <laughs> and there he's in a, you know, bowl of soup. Um, and in food and cooking, you'll also find those non-obvious ones, like to curry favor or grilled by the police. Again, they put that in food because of curry, to curry favor, curry is a spice, or grilled relates to food. So um, it kind of mixes it up and there's always a surprise no matter you know, what chapter you're on in terms of which expression they placed where. So fun, I love it. Okay, I really loved playing that little game with you. I get a sense that this book can be something that can be really interactive and help kind of fuel exchanges between friends or family members, maybe even something you could do virtually if a couple of people own the book. Can you talk any more about some of the other types of games or things that can be done with the book interactively? Sure. Well, um, my parents felt that the most important thing about the book is it's a catalyst for conversations, that it sparks conversations, particularly intergenerational conversations. Um, and frankly, to be really honest, Amanda, when they first said, we're doing this book, we're collecting expressions, my parents were very fun and lively. We're like, okay, you know, whatever you want, mom and dad, sounds great. And little did we know we would all get so addicted to hunting for expressions. You know, my husband would be up for hours and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I have a list of expressions. I think I'm going to get a few that your dad doesn't have. And my dad would call me and say, oh, I hate to break it to David, but we had those, you know, <laughs> and it was just a fun um, activity um, that, you know, ended up in this book. Um, but the great thing also about expressions is they're very personal and they can reflect who you are or where you grew up. So they have this, uh, these lined pages um, called Express Yourself, and they wanted people to write down their own family expressions or any expressions they've come across that isn't in the book. And just to have it like a family record um, to discuss things. Um, and they, they had a funny story about one of their friends, Diane, um, told them about an old Irish expression, which is as fast as O'Grady's dog. So she'd, you know, she'd say if somebody was eating too fast, oh, stop eating so fast, you're eating as, as fast as O'Grady's dog. Um, and basically, it describes someone who's doing something quickly or someone who's moving quickly. And one day, uh, Diane met her mother's childhood friend uh, who started talking about the old neighborhood. And she was saying, yes, and there was this nice family in our neighborhood called the O'Grady's. And oh, did your mom ever tell you they had a crazy dog who would run out of the house every time we'd open the door? And then suddenly it dawned on Diane that as fast as O'Grady's dog wasn't an old Irish expression at all. It was just a family expression that only her neighborhood knew, her mother's neighborhood knew in, in Ireland, but her mother said it, she moved to New York, Diane said it, Diane taught, taught it to her kids, Diane's kids say it, her friends say it, everyone says O'Grady's, as fast as O'Grady's dog, which wasn't really a real expression. So those kind of things that sometimes you think, do other families say this? <laughs> it, it, it sort of is a fun thing to talk about and to realize. Nice. Gage wants to know about origin stories and if there's a section of the book or if the book delves a little bit deeper into that or if it's something on the website. Right. So in the website, we have lots of origin games with the origin stories. But my parents felt very specifically that the book should be it's all, when reading it it's almost like you know reading poetry it's all about the fun of the chapter you know i could pick up any chapter 
and open it to any page, like what do I have? Uh, let's see. So there's a chapter called Earth, Fire, Water, and Air. And just grabbing something. Uh, in another world, in one's own world, the leader of the free world, you mean the world to me, move up in the world. It's not the end of the world. You only go through this world once, otherworldly, out of this world, out to change the world. I mean, I could go on and on. And it's fun because it's suddenly, oh, wow, language is so interesting and how all these different expressions merge. So there are origin stories um, because, specifically because it's supposed to be the enjoyment of language and the play. And that is where the internet comes in. My parents did not use Google to find expressions, but they knew once you found one that you didn't know the meaning to, you could just Google it and then find the answer of what, you know, what it means. Because often there are many different origin stories too. There's usually not one definitive one that we absolutely know, you know, led to this expression. So it's more of a book, it's a catalyst for conversation and game playing. Um, and you could just look up the definitions anywhere you want. Um, and this is the game, uh, the, some of the 20, uh, the two dozen games that are in here. Um, and, you know, like you said, with families staying home right now, it is a lot of fun to play the game, to play the games. Uh, plus the illustrations lead to lots of opportunity for guessing games as well. Um, so I don't know, Amanda, if you want to, or anybody could chime in too, we can play another game. Um, this one is guessing what the image is, what the, what the expression is that uh, the image represents. So well, that sounds fun. Does, does anybody else want to play? If so, then uh, you can just jot me a little note if you want. Um, but yeah, okay, so. What's this uh, one? This, this one, one is uh, Elephant in the Room. Right, we gave that one away, okay. This next one. Um, let's see, it's like a mermaid and a shell. Um, what is she doing? Coming out of one show. Exactly. One show. You're a ringer. That's good. Okay. Here's I got one. distracted by the mermaid, though. I thought it was something. Specific. <laughs> um, this could be a theme <clears throat> mix, actually. Uh, keep your eye on the ball. That's exactly right. Oh, <laughs> That's good. Most people guess. Uh, uh, what do they guess? Something else, but you got it. That's the one exactly that I meant because her eye is on the ball. She's really yeah. staring at the ball. Okay, this next one is a little tricky. It's more when you're, and this is one of the games you can sort of play like a um, match game or some sort of uh, like password. I could give you clues. Like when you're in a group of people and they're a couple and you're not. Uh -huh. Yeah, Gage got it. The third wheel. Yep. <laughs> That's right, Gage. Um, and let's see, we have this one. I'll give you Anybody a got any ideas about that one? Let's see. Nose buried in a book. Could be, actually. Definitely could be that. What I had in mind was he was sort of balancing the books. Balancing the books. And the expression to balance your books, you know, the accountants balance their books. Um, so uh, it's oh, fun. Yeah, it's fun. You know, I was mm -hmm. uh, interviewed by this woman today on the radio and she was saying, you know, this has been blowing my mind. <laughs> she said, you know, the more I look at it, I'm like, wow, words can be used in such different ways to mean such different things. And she said she was talking to her, uh, she had a 12 year old son about it. And because her husband said the expression as the crow flies and her son's like, what does that mean? And, um, and then he said, six ways from Sunday. And he's like, what does that mean? You know, and in the book, they have a whole chapter on numbers. Uh, so everything, every expression that comes, you know, uh, six ways from Sunday to, uh, to give someone your two cents. Um, and all the different uh, expressions having to do with numbers chronologically. But um, I feel like it's important to say that you don't have to just look at these British drawings. 
um, to put expressions to photos. Um, here's a picture of my parents kicking up their heels and happy as clams. Uh, wow. And here they are when they were callow youths and diamonds in the rough. Uh, and here they are at their, um, uh, my mom's 85th birthday uh, where they were two peas in pod uh, in their golden years. So um, we can do one more lightning round if you like, uh, Amanda, um, of my personal favorite game, which is called Real or Fake. Real or fake. Okay, I was going to ask you of the games in the back, which one you liked the most. This is Real it. or fake. Okay. I'm ready. So here you go. So um, is this expression real or fake? Um, fuzzy as powder in water. Fake. You're right. It's always <laughs> darkest. You're right, Gage. It's always darkest under the lighthouse. Fake. Real, that's a real one. It's always darkest under the lighthouse. Um, you know, I guess it has to do with a lighthouse, you know, throws the light out to the surrounding area, but right by the structure, it's dark. Um, I've yellow, always heard darkest before dawn. That's another one. That's right, that's right. Somebody said that they thought that's what it was, but it was, that's the real one. Uh, a yellow dog contract. Yellow dog contract. Fake. It's real. Uh, it's illegal to have a yellow dog contract, but in the, I think the 1920s, employers would hire someone and say, I'll hire you as long as you promise not to join a union. So that's a yellow dog contract. And that's been, you know, outlawed, thankfully, since, since then. Um, and here's the last one. Even the smartest cow is illiterate. Fake. It is fake. I haven't <laughs> made that one up. I love that one though. It's hilarious. Um, and the last game, this is a real quick one. Malaprops. Um, it, is it dog, doggy dog world or dog eat dog world? Dog eat dog. Correct. This is a hard one. Is it to home in or to hone in? I'm going to say hone with an N. You're right. Very good. That's a really hard one. I didn't know that one. I would always mix that up. Um, and to clinch the deal or to cinch the deal? Cinch the deal. It's to clinch the deal. Clinch. Is it really? <laughs> the cinch is like what you do to like pull in your waist. A belt will yeah, cinch in your waist. I know. It, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. And this one's really tricky. Is it champing at the bit or chomping at the bit? Oh, I always say chomping. It's probably wrong. Right. I say that too. Everyone says that, but it originally started the number one, like the most uh, preferred uh, um, uh, expression is champing at the bit because champing oh. means to chew and chomping means to chew loudly too. But it originally started as champing and people replaced it with chomping. Interesting. So there you go. So to speak, like I said, the website is so to speak book.com. But if you want the real experience, you got to get the book, um, which is 11,000 expressions and hundreds and hundreds of illustrations. And I feel like it's the type of thing that families could kind of have forever. And you write in it, you know, some of the expressions in the back and you know, it's just the labor of love. And I think everybody, you know, who has gotten it has said, wow, like it's just kind of mind blowing that two people would collect these and organize them. And it leads to kind of, kind of endless fun that knocks your socks off. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations. Thank you. Job well done. You. It's such a lovely way to honor your parents and language, and it sounds like their legacy of fun educational games. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very excited to get a copy. Thank you for telling us about it and for coming to our virtual event. It was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Does anyone else have any questions? At this point, I usually will allow the participants to unmute themselves. Um, that way they can. Thank you, Gage. Uh, 
say hello to each other and say hello to you. Okay, so if you'd like to do that now, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to. I usually just use this as a time to thank the author and to maybe send away with some applause. It sort of takes the place of the signing. This is when you would be saying, oh, hello, thank you so much. For <laughs> so thank you, Beth. Thank you, thank you, Amanda. That was really, really fun. And you're good at this. I can tell you've been in the, the word business for a long time. Oh, thank you. We did about 77 virtual events in 2020. Wow. We started out um, our second season of those. On Sunday, I will let you guys know, we're hosting Brandon Hobson, speaking of wordsmiths. He was a national book award finalist for his first book. And this book is called The Removed. It is a novel that takes place in Cherokee country um, around the time of Indian removal. And he's from Oklahoma. So I'm really excited to host that on Sunday. I did not realize it was Super Bowl Sunday, but the event starts at three. So I think we will be done in time for the Super Bowl. Okay, Scott wants to know what were some expressions your parents used a lot when you were growing up? Oh, wow. Uh, well, my mom would always say, Beth, you're burning the candle at both ends. That was her favorite thing to say. Uh, and my dad would say, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Or he was pretty serious. He had one, um, he made one up that he said all the time, we do what we have to do, not what we want to do. So he was like, a, <laughs> and my moms were a little more fun. Um, she liked the proof is in the pudding or, <laughs> yeah. So it, it is fun to go down memory lane and to think of those. Do you think that as time goes on, those expressions are being lost and that idioms are, are becoming fewer in our language? I, I think that they're certainly changing. Um, you know, for my age, you'd say, if you use, say, the term to gossip, you'd say to dig the dirt. Mm -hmm. And now young people say to spill the tea. Um, and I, it's been fun to sort of see that the changing way words um, develop. I don't think there are fewer expressions. I think they're constantly changing. Um, but, you know, a lot of expressions, and they have a whole section in the book on, you know, acronyms, a lot of expressions, if you call them expressions, LOL, and, you know, all the things we say online that we've gotten so accustomed to saying um, are really expressions. Mm -hmm. So um, I, and my parents, even though they were not big Googlers, they did feel that, you know, that was part of a language too. Um, and, you know, I think that's the optimistic view of it. I think uh, some though will be lost forever, you know, don't put the cart before the horse, you know, that was back in the day when we didn't have cars <laughs> and those things are really uh, changing. And which is why it's so much fun to talk about them, especially with young children. So they learn, you know, ants in your pants and it doesn't mean ants crawling up your leg. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how these expressions have just evolved over time and been passed down from generation to generation. And will our young children have the same expressions and keep passing along? Will it be ants in your pants or will it be something different? Right, right. Right, I know. It. it's really true. Even through COVID, you know, it's like socially distanced, and um, uh, there's so many. I'm uh, well. My three-year-old now says Zoom meeting. Zoom Brothers meeting. in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, it really changed. The world changed, and everybody has a very uh, a common language uh, to share. Uh, you know, and, and interestingly enough, like most expressions. Uh, I, when my parents and I would talk about them, we looked through a lot of the different sections and they're more bleak expressions than happy ones. Um, mm -hmm. Like in, they have a section on heaven and hell and in the heaven, there are fewer, like half the number of ones than there are for hell. Uh, and it could possibly be that when people were ex experienced things over time, they wanted a shorthand way to say something that's bad. Um, so, uh, stop, she said, stop being so wiggly. I use this a lot for the kids. That's a good one too. You know, 
Yeah, wiggly worm. And I do think you remember that. I mean, I always think about my mother saying, don't burn the candle at both ends. I always like would imagine a candle with two wicks. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad, you know, they really spent this time and I think it kept their minds super sharp. I mean, my dad to the very end was saying, make sure the cover, you know, really make sure the cover reflects the expressions in me. It made them think. Um, and I think, you know, we know some research has shown that games and constantly thinking and mixing up the way you think about things. Are you looking at things visually or is it auditory or is it with your eyes? And, you know, that's visual, yeah. Uh, but, or reading it, how do you process information? And I think the, the different ways you do it makes it more, you know, makes those synapses start snapping, I think. You know, there've been re some research that shows that those kind of word games could potentially help people, you know, keep their mind active. Absolutely, brain games. My mom and her husband do that. Um, did your, your mom had some sort of a background, didn't she working with children that maybe had some disabilities or developmental? Yeah. Yes, uh, so I have a brother who has a, a we call it like learning disability. Um, and I think my parents really devoted a lot of time to that. My father actually introduced um, uh, special education into middle schools. It had never been in middle schools before in New York City. So he created a model for that. And wow. my mom helped find, uh, found an organization for children with cognitive disabilities. And again, they were always thinking about different ways to teach kids. And they were really wonderful when it comes to kids because, you know, people would think, oh, you know, there's so much testing. Is my kid not keeping up? Are they not at their level? And their advice was always, don't look at them compared to other children. Just look at where they were last year and this then compare it to this year and have they, you know, gone in the right direction. And it's sort of brilliant advice, you know, and they really knew about education, which is why I think the book is so good uh, for parents and children to have these kind of conversation. It also gives you something to talk about because sometimes, you know, your kid comes home, how was your day? Oh, it was okay. And then the conversation ends. Whereas this is kind of a fun um, way to mix it up a little bit, an expression, mix it up a little bit. Absolutely. Got to make it fun when you're trying to teach them these things. Okay. And I just, I have to ask what, what about your parents? Did they, were they able to see the book in its completion and what yeah. were their thoughts about that? So my mom died a couple of years ago and honestly, my dad was thinking he wouldn't do the book at all. And then friends of mine, friends of his started saying, Harold, I came up with another expression. He's like, okay. And then he <laughs> said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for Shirley. Um, and I'm going to finish this project. And he saw, he, the most important thing was he knew Simon and Schuster was bought the book. They wanted to publish it. And that meant the world to him. And he also saw the cover. Um, he didn't see this final, final cover. But he knows me and he knew when I promised to have that room around the elephant, I would get the room around the elephant <laughs> if I had to draw it myself. <laughs> um, and so it does make me a little sad that they weren't here to hold it or to hear lexicographers say how great it is. But I do know, and my dad died in May um, and he was 90 years old and he was and I mean, this sounds crazy, but the day before he died, I, I printed out the cover in the color and I printed out the book and I said, dad, hold it. And he's like, oh, wow, it's amazing. You know, and he, he got very, very close to, you know, he saw the cover, he knew it was sold. And I feel like, you know, I thought it was going to be so, so terribly sad to do this, but it's actually been a lot of fun because I'm just connecting with them um in so many different ways 